Now, as we start, we're defining this as knowing God. We're defining this. No. Okay. We're defining this aspect as knowing God. It's the, it's the, the broadest framework to be able to work from. Now, as we look at the week, let me give you an outline of where we're going to go. <clears throat> we're going to talk today about destiny and what is the fear of God and linking destiny to the fear of God. Now, let me put a disclaimer in this. A lot of what we're going to talk about this week isn't necessarily new. Okay, it may be in one sense in the way it's presented, but these are kind of foundation stones. These are things that you can't get away from. These are kind of the basics of our faith. And so, as we look at this, we're going to be linking through this and going, okay, First, we'll start with, we have a destiny. The destiny in God is linked to the fear of the Lord. And without the fear of the Lord, we can't reach our destiny. Then the second half today, we'll talk about heart problems. Um, and heart problems really uh, relates to, in our desire to know God, where do we get into trouble? What hinders us? What slows us down? What limits God in revealing himself to us? So that will be number two. Then the next message will be truth and tension. This aspect of who is God. This, this uh, greatness and goodness of God. Um, as we look at. So, in essence, our faith is linked to a God who is big enough. <clears throat> and a God who is good enough. Okay? So, that we'll put legs to faith. We'll give ourselves an expression of how, what is our faith attached to in our walk with God. Then we'll go to a God who is worthy, okay? Um, and w what is important about the worthiness of God? And in, in essence, we'll frame it this way. Why choose God? Okay? So that will be um, the next. And then we'll go to the kingdom of God. And we'll look at the kingdom of God. That it's not a neutral playing field. That, it's a, um, that Satan's attack is, is to destroy the character of God. And when he destroys our perception of the character of God, we lose out. And it's not a, a neutral playing field. We're actually engaged in warfare to understand who God is. So we're going to talk about that. And then we're going to talk about the broken heart of God. This God who loves sacrificially and has exposed himself, has become vulnerable to us, to the nations, um, and, and revealed his heart for us. And then the last one we'll look at by Friday will be the humility of God. We're going to look at um, this aspect of God is how does he win us over? Um, yeah, in his great humility. So that's going to be our week. That will take us through 10 sessions, um, an hour apiece as we work through those. And um, we'll jump with that. Okay, so. We start with destiny, reaching our destiny, and you can't reach your destiny without the fear of the Lord. Now, I, I know this sounds, we agree to this in principle. We acknowledge it. But what does it mean? And that's what we want to be able to look at. In Deuteronomy, uh, <clears throat> he says, So the Lord command, <clears throat> commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God, for our good always, for our survival as it is today. Now, for whose good? <clears throat> our good. <clears throat> and this is what we've got to see. God links the, the fear of the Lord to His authority, to his, who He is, for our good. Okay, He says it again in Deuteronomy 5.29. Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it may be well with them and their sons forever. So if I were to say with you, say to you, how can you keep it well? How can you be blessed and your son's sons be blessed? Or <clears throat> how can we make sure that the children are blessed? We must teach them the fear of God. Now, as soon as we talk about the fear of God, you know, we, we, we may get these funny ideas of, uh, my idea of the fear of the Lord was a man standing up, preaching with a foot-long bony finger, looking at everybody going, you are going to hell today if you don't follow Jesus. And, ah! and we you know, run back into this. That's not what the Bible is talking about. So what, what we're looking at is, 
what is this fear of God aspect? What, how, where does it do with us, and where does it take us? And um, okay, let's just jump right in and start to look at some some history as far as people goes. Abraham and his destiny. Now, what was his destiny? Okay, don't don't worry about the video. So, just talk to me. What was his what was his destiny? Be the father of the nation. Yeah. But we have to go. What does that mean? So, really make it tangible, concrete. What does it mean to be the father of a nation? Well, how would you measure that? How would you know when God did it? Give me a concrete. What was his destiny? How about have a child with Sarah? Pretty concrete. Okay, you know when you've had a child, you don't go, oh, is it there yet? <laughs> child? Yes. My destiny. Okay, nice, concrete, tangible, measurable, quantifiable. Okay. So, his destiny is to have a child. Now, He's on his way to the Negi. The king sees his wife and takes her. She's, now, Sarah's at least 65 years old. Now, she must have been quite a lady. Because the king can have anybody he wants. And here's a 65-year-old woman that comes by, and the king goes, Yeah, I like this. this. Now, what is, Abraham, what is Abraham's response? He's petrified. He's petrified. And he gave it away. And he gave it away. So what does he give away? His destiny. He gave away his destiny. Now, this is a very important thing to, to, to see in this process. He's not just giving a child away. Because his destiny is through Sarah to produce a child that would grow into, through the power of God, to be the father of the nations. So he gives away his destiny. Now, let's look at the reason why. So, Abraham's reason. So, Genesis chapter 20, verse 10. Now, Abimelech is the king. So, let's set this up real quick. Abimelech takes Sarah, okay, and he goes to bed one night, and God comes to him in a dream, and basically, very loose translation, the angel says to Abimelech, you're a dead man. All your people are dead. In fact, I've said, a hit squad out to you, you will cease to exist. Do you get my point? Abimelech goes, I think I get your point. I didn't touch the woman, God. And God goes, I know. I helped you with that. Okay? So, then Abimelech wakes up. He calls all of his wise men together, pulls them together, and he says, we're dead. We're finished. We're done. He comes to, to uh, Abraham, and then here's what he says. What have you encountered that you have done this thing? So the king asks a great question. What would cause you to do this, to destroy us as a nation? What would cause you to do such a hideous thing? And here is the father of our faith, great response. Because I thought, surely, what does it say? There is no fear of God in this place. They will kill me because of my wife. Now, I love that. That is absolutely classic. Because it's still the argument today. Well, you know, if, if my people and my family were more Christian, then I, I could love God with my family. If people at work had more of the fear of God, then I could be more like this. If YWAM had more fear of the God, then I could do what I really wanted to do. You know, them. What's really the problem with Abraham? Where is there no fear of God? In his heart? In his life, in his heart. And this is a challenge for him. Because it's not about being out there. It's about being in here. He doesn't have the fear of the Lord. So, here's the challenge for us, okay? There's no fear of God in his life. You can't separate your destiny from the fear of the Lord. God will put in your heart a desire to do things. Okay, so far, no problem. But here's the hard part. 
that you can't do. Now you may think this is unfair. Because here God has given you a desire to do things that it's not within your power to do. But you have the desire to do it. But you can't do it. But you must do it. But you can't do it. Now, that is why we need the fear of the Lord, is because without the fear of the Lord, you will be dependent upon yourself, you will be dependent upon your resources, you will be dependent upon your capacities, you will be dependent upon your culture, you will be dependent upon your family, you will be dependent upon whatever resources you're pulling from. And with only those limitations, you can't do it. Why? Now, why would God limit it himself to give you the desire to do something that you can't do? Now, this has been particularly interesting for me back in, in Singapore right now. I've had this desire to be involved in business, but I don't have a marketing bone in my body. Not a marketing bone in my body. So here I must market myself, but I don't have the gift sets. Here I must do something to walk into what God has called me to do, but I literally don't have the capacity to do that. And boy, does it cause a travailing of the soul. God, if I didn't know him better, I was because you've asked me to do something that I can't do. It's like saying to a child, child, I'd like you to fly. <laughs> no parent would, would ask a child to fly, would he? Why? Because they know they can't do it. Because we would only ask our children to do something that they could do. And here God turns around and he says to you, child, fly. <laughs> that makes me so mad. Well, this is, we're going to talk about this in the next session in regards to where we get into trouble because there's control issues going on. But here God says to us, not that he's unjust. Remember, he's just, but he's not fair. Fairness is a human condition. Justice is his quality. Okay, God is not fair. Fairness would mean, in all situations, everybody would be dealt with the same way. And God doesn't do that. He loves us too much. <clears throat> so here's God, who comes to us, comes to Abraham, recognizes Abraham's tendencies as a human, as an aspect of what he's got to walk into. And Abraham, now actually this is the second time that he's done this. This is not even the first time. He's going, this is, you know, oh, you want my wife? Oh, she's only my sister. Sure, take her, spare me. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the way I like to say it is simply this. God is bigger than our choices. Yet, or as we could say, but, he will not override them. And again, we'll, as we get into this week, we'll look at what that means. Because there's, there's almost a, a dilemma in this. He won't override our choices, but he's bigger than our choices. It sounds like almost a contradiction. Whether well, do we have any authority to make a choice if he's going to be bigger than our choice? And that will lead us into a little bit later in this week. <clears throat> but it's very important for us. Why? Because God respects your choices. And your choices really are real. They really do matter. There really are consequences to your choices. And they are your choices. And if you want to be stupid, you have that choice. And he will not take it from you. But he's bigger than your choice. And what does that mean if we look at it within a biblical framework? He can bring good out of any choice when we invite him into it. Now this is huge for us. Because sometimes we can get so caught up on our choices that it's like, what if I make the wrong choice? Well, you will. Don't worry. But, God is bigger than the choice. And here, twice, the second time we just looked at, God says to Abraham, son, I know you're afraid. And I'm going to walk through this process with you. And I'm going to teach you the fear of God. Because I want you to walk into your destiny. I want you to walk into this place where I have called you. And I think God would say it this way. But I've made you dependent upon me. And without me, you can't do this. 
See, that's why God limits himself, gives us a choice, and asks us to do things we can't do, but then invites us to say, you know, son or daughter, if you'll invite me into this, I'll help you. I'll be the I can't do it part and be with you in this process. Now, the good news is it takes Abraham, I don't know how many years, 25 years to figure this process out. So this isn't going to be, we listen to a lecture series and go, oh, I have a fear of God. Oh, everything's going to be okay. Oh, I'll just make all the right choices. And then it doesn't work that way, okay? So God's in this process of discipling Abraham to help him learn the fear of God so that as he learns the fear of God, he says to us who will follow him, understand the challenges that he faced in his ministry and his destiny to produce something beyond himself in this capacity. Okay. <clears throat> now let's look at some other choices and then we'll come back to Abraham. Okay? So, build an ark. Noah. Where there is no water. Uh, at least, maybe literally, or but at least we know not directly around him. So he's not saying build an ark on the coast. He's saying build an ark, a very big boat, in a place where there's no water. Now because the, the ecosystems, the... The, the atmosphere, I don't know, I can't think of the right word right now, but because the world is pre-flood, it's actually a different place. Springs of the deep have not broken open. You know, the mist used to come up and water the earth. So I, I don't know what that earth was like, but we do know this. This idea of boat, building a boat was a little bit absurd. So God comes to him and tells him to build a boat. Now notice, notice the awkwardness of this. Build a boat where there is no water. Talk about a setup. In other words, if God doesn't show up, boy, does he got mud on his face. This is not going to be good. And this is this is the challenge for him. Okay, no, build an ark. 110 years. I think is what it takes for the building. <clears throat> build it. Get the animals. Put them in the ark. I mean, just think of the logistics of this alone. Get the animals. <laughs> This is absurd. But he does it. Now, how does he do it? Here we go. By faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. So what, was, what allowed him to walk into his destiny to save the world? To do something within his power, but recognizing that God had to do something more than this. This, you have a choice, it really does matter, but God wants to help you to know that that isn't going to be enough. You need him to do this. David, youngest with seven handsome brothers, taking care of the sheep, and I would say it this way, an embarrassment to his father. Now he writes about in Psalm 51.5, he says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Yet he, okay. So, now some people use this as a theology. They go, David is telling us a, th a theology of original sin. Now, I, I, I'm not buying that. Because if you read the Psalms that David writes, you don't necessarily want to make a theology out of it. Why? Because he says things like this. Take the babies, beat them against the rocks, destroy them, kill them, maim them, do all, you know, he's this warrior who has this aspect. I think he's talking here about the pain of his life. I think he's an embarrassment to his father. That he's probably born out of wedlock with another woman. And when it just so happens that when the prophet comes, all seven of his older brothers are there, and where is David? Gone. Little guy. That nobody wanted. Take care of the sheep, David. Go out. Okay? Now, David has the choice to go, well, you know, my dad doesn't want me. Or maybe, you know, you'll, you'll run into kids who go, well, I'm an unwanted child. And, you know, if there's any sense of abandonment or any sense of the issues going on within you, you'll be able to identify with that child and go, yes, I understand. It's so horrible and painful world we live in. Or we can choose God's side and go, yes, but 
No child is abandoned in the heart of God. Yes, but somewhere David, looking at the stars, worshiping God, found a revelation of God. So that when he walks into a situation, okay, he sees Goliath there. Okay, so he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God? He has this view of God that allows him to walk into a situation and go, yeah, but. Here's how God sees this situation. And all of the army is terrified. They're, he, Goliath is out mocking them, and as he's out mocking them, David walks out there, and he's not looking at the giant, he's looking at God, and he's saying, who do you think you are? He says, you come to me with a spear and a sword and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel. Fear of God in this little, little guy's life. Steps up, walks out to it. Now, let me say this, okay. David is prepared. Preparation is important. He faces a bear. He faces a lion. He's, he's, he is out there every day with the rocks, you know. So in our youth today, in kind of the Pentecostal framework of mind, you know, somebody hears this message and they go, great. So he picks up a rock, he takes on a glass, he goes, great, I'll just, I'll take him on right now. Don't do it. God has prepared him for this. There is a preparation that is needed for the big events where God has prepared him. So you don't know how many rocks David has, has practiced with. It says, when it spoke of these guys, it says they could split a hair when it was talking about their capacity. So you don't know how many times he's putting a rock and it's just like, you know, the first time goes, because you don't know what's going on in this. So there's a preparation behind the scenes that God is doing in a life that is preparing him for the public ministry in this process, okay? So the training is important, but the training was linked to, okay, I can do a certain part, but then I've got to see things with God's perspective. I've got to be able to engage this from God's perspective, okay? And that's why we're talking about this as the first message. The fear of the Lord is simply a way of saying, what is God's perspective of this? <clears throat> now here's Israel, the whole generation is lost. I mean, why are they lost? Because 12 spies go into the land, 10 come back, and what's their message? Stay away. Yeah. We saw the descendants of Anak there, the land that devours its inhabitants and all the people who are in it. We saw the size and great size. We became like grasshoppers. You know, it's not, it's not with that tone, it's more with this tone. We, we were like grasshoppers in their sight. They're so big and we're so small. Notice how they're framing it. What do we have? What is my capacity? What is my resources? We can't do it. And believe me, when you're talking about children at risk, when you're talking about these aspects of life, it is overwhelming. You draw back into your perspective. You go back to go, how much love do I have to give? How many needs can I meet? What, what is within my capacity? And it will chew you up and spit you out for breakfast. Because it's all within ourselves. You don't have to save the world. You just have to take the world from God's perspective and do what he's called you to do. Now, a whole generation is lost. And I think this is a valid warning for all of us. There are generations that can be lost. Why? Because leadership will not give the message in the heart of God. Two of them, Joshua and Caleb, do. But ten of them don't. They give what the Bible says is a bad report. Now, what is a bad report? A bad report is not a, a report that does not have God's perspective in mind. And a whole generation is lost. Forty years. One year for each day the spies were in the wilderness. The spies were in the promised land. Forty years. One whole generation lost. Why? No fear of God. They looked with their own eyes. Okay? Now, we'll go back to Abraham. Okay? Now, Genesis chapter 22, verse 1. Now, it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. And he said, Take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, 
and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains on which I will tell you. Okay, now it doesn't, you know, we're down to 11 verse here, but verse 11 here, but in this process it says, early the next morning he arises, he takes the sun, the wood, the fire, packs it up, and off he heads. In other words, he doesn't delay it, he doesn't put it off, something has changed. In other words, from 20 to 22, he got his son, he, he is viewing the world differently. The fear of the Lord finally settles into his life. He takes his son, he takes, builds the altar, he puts his son on the altar, and he raises the knife, and he says, okay, here we go. And it says, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And he said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him, for now I know that you fear God. Since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And I guess, I guess theologians tell us that this place where he was willing to offer his son is where Jesus was crucified on the cross. Now, what is this thing that happens? And we're going to, that's what this week is about. That's why we start here. This changing in Abraham's life, this changing of perspective, this changing of what goes on inside of him, this changing of the heart, this changing of the way he thinks, this, these changes of foundations that God is building into what we would call faith is so radical that he's willing to walk into a situation that is absolutely beyond his capacity to control. Take my son, God. Why does he do it? What does Hebrews tell us? He considered that God is able to raise men even from the dead, that which he received him back as a type. He learned something about the greatness of God. So he's aware. Now remember, let me say this. This is taken in, I don't know the exact, but this is taken in what, 30 years to figure out? Hear that. We're talking about seeds of truth. God wants to grow in our lives. Right? Seeds of truth that God wants to grow in our lives that would transform our life. But will take many years to walk out. And I, I can't say that is important enough today because... You, you know, we could go, well, just get this series in. Just, no. All I'm, all's we can ask is this week, in these lectures to come, is that you get seeds of truths. And they will just be seeds. But that's the beginning place. Life is in the seed, but the, the life in the seed must be water, growth, sun, you know, light. Um, grown into maturity. And if God takes the father of our faith, Abraham, and says to him, Son, I'm going to teach you some things that will be very important to other people walking this out. Recognize that this is the process that all of us are in in our lives. Okay, God, teach me the fear of God. Grow it up within me. Let this <clears throat> rise up within me. And the thing that God will do, He will use, is the desires in your heart. Now I think of um, Joseph. It says in the Psalms, it says, until the word of the Lord came to pass, it what? It tested him. Now, what we're talking about today, the word of the Lord was a destiny. The word of the Lord was a capacity to do something that was beyond him. The word of the Lord was to step outside of cultural, family, gifting capacities. Not removing them, but recognizing them. And to go beyond that. Here's Joseph. He has a dream. He has a desire. And what's the preparation of him? Many years. 13 years from the time he's Potiphar to 
second in command. See, there is a there is a growth aspect to our relationship with God that isn't isn't revelation in the sense of wow, it's all taken care of, but it's revelation that's a seed. And you water and grow and develop this so that it becomes like a mustard seed that the birds of the air can come and feed on. In other words, you're able to give out of the abundance of what's in your life. Okay, now, I had to go back. Uh, when I was in Hawaii and I was over our DTSs there, I had to go back and I said, Lord, what do I... What do I do? I, I, I'm frustrated. Because we'd have students that would come to our DTSs, we'd have students that would come to our programs, and they'd have this wonderful experience with God, and then some of them would go home and they'd just start sleeping with their boyfriend, start taking drugs again, because the camp experience didn't really get them through. And I thought, Lord, what is the fear of the Lord? I know it, okay, I know that this fear of the Lord is linked to our capacity to hate evil. It's the beginning of wisdom. It's this, it's this, it's the garden plot. It's this place where life is formed and shaped. It's the womb. Right? It's whatever metaphor we want to use. It's this place where, where when, when we get this, life will be produced from it. If we don't get this, it's the truths are forgotten and it's taken away. There's no capacities in this life. So I was wrestling with this, and I, I, I was. I was thinking, God, I, I'm not content with this. I'm frustrated. What is going on? So I, you know, I'm just kind of carrying this question. What is the fear of the Lord? We need the fear of the Lord, and we don't have it. I was getting on a flight from Kona to L.A., and he, God just spoke one little word to me. I had this impression, and the idea was simply this. A fear of the Lord, an tangible expression is it's a battle for context. It's a battle for context. So now let me walk you through my thinking with this, okay, to help explain what I mean by this. So what I did was I went back to the dictionary and I said, okay, what is context? So when I looked at this, it says, context is defined as, okay, parts surrounding a word, sentence, or passage which help determine the meaning. Surrounding environment, Latin context, this, joining together, connection, going back to con together, texture to we. So I'm thinking, okay, now, how does this apply? Now, as this started to fall together for me, it's like all the pieces kind of came together for me, because now I could understand why the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, how it's set up to help us. But what we don't realize is, what we're struggling with, is what's the context? So, with children at risk, what's the context for these kids? Who defines what their role is, what their place is? Who defines how we take care of them? Who defines the wisdom that we need to engage them? <coughs> Okay, so, let's just use these words. Let's just say, if I use the words, I can't do that. Now, what do those words mean? Now, we know what the words <coughs> semantically mean, meaning they have just certain words. But in the context, what are we looking for? Because it could be a statement of refusal. Okay, so I could say, uh, I'd like you to take uh, uh, your computer and throw it on the ground. And you would say, can't do that. Okay, it could be a moral conviction. You know, I'd like you to go out and do something stupid. You know, take drugs and whatever. And you would say, can't do it. Capacity you could. But conviction, you can't. It could be a statement of fact about limitations. I'd say, <coughs> okay, I'd like you to hover five, five feet off the ground for an hour. <laughs> and you'd say, <coughs> I can't do that. I would if I could, but I can't. Okay? Could, is it rebellion? I'd like, to, I'd like you to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. 
And you would say, can't do that. Okay, it could be a statement about inferiority, inferiority or self-image. So I could hold up a mirror to you, and I could have you turn and look at that mirror and see yourself in the mirror, and then I, I could say to you, now, say these words, you are beautiful. And you would say, I can't do that. <coughs> okay, an invitation for more conversation, or a statement about gifts or ministry. So you, someone might say, the tones, Ooh, I can't do that. Now, how do we define the meaning of these words? What do you need? Context. A context. Because the context, the story, gives us the pieces to know how to draw meaning out of this. <coughs> so if I said this, Dwayne looked down at Mindy, his secretary, and said, if my wife calls, tell her, tell her I'm at a conference. Mindy looked up at the woman standing next to him. Dwayne looked at her and smiled. She is my conference. Don't tell my wife. The secretary looked up at him and said, I can't do that. Now, do you know what those words mean? Sure. It's absolutely clear. Why? Because you have a context. You have a frame, a story, a reference point that says to you, this is how you should do this. This is how you should look at this. This is how you should understand, put the pieces together. Okay, now let's take a step back. <coughs> now, what did we lose in our rebellion? Genesis 3, 9, And the Lord called to the man, and he said to him, Where are you? Now, Remember, God is brilliant. Okay, that's an important part of his job description. Okay, who is God must be brilliant. Okay. This is a brilliant question. If this question is the perfect question, then only God can ask the perfect question. What did we lose? If someone asks, where are you? What are they, what did we... What do we have to know about the situation for that to be the perfect question? Adam and Eve, they've eaten of the fruit, they've taken of it. What have we got to ask? Why, why is this the perfect question? God's first question for fallen mankind. If someone is lost, they have no context. If you say, where are you? They have no framework to know the meanings, the values, the context of what is going on. All of that is gone. So what they do, the very first thing, is they hide, they cover themselves, and God has to ask, where are you? Now, if you follow this theme through, and we'll do this in the second half today, if you follow that theme all the way through, New Testament, he says this, and this is the judgment that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness. Now, what does darkness give us? What does darkness give us? It removes the context. So what we see, beginning in Genesis, is what, what people want to do is they want to define the world. They want to define themselves. They want to define their relationships, how they want to define them. In other words, what the context, the meaning, the values. What we want to say is, I will be God. I will define what is valuable. I will define how we relate. I will define how life is. <clears throat> and that's why we love darkness. Because darkness gets... You when, you when darkness is there, you get to do anything you want, and nobody can question it. Why? Because darkness protects you. So I can stand, I can make a face. You know, I can do whatever I want, and you, 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 can, you can agree or disagree with me, but as long as I'm in darkness, I can go, you can't see me, you don't know, you don't understand, I am safe. See, it's light that gives a context. 
It's the truth. It's revelation that says to us, no, this is what a life is worth. No, this is what children are worth. No, this is who should take care of the family. So some of you, when you go, yes, but we should have many orphanages and we should do these certain things, and you have these strong feelings about that. Well, frankly, what you have to say is, it's irregardless of what do I think. What does God think? How did he set up social structures? Who should children be with? What is the family dynamic? What does God tell us? Because if that, if he isn't the one, if he's not the defining one who says to us, children are defined by these ways. Life, culture. Now, some of us get real rigid and go, oh, he's going to take, oh, you're going to define everything. You live this way. You can't wear these clothes. That's not what God does. He, he says there's certain values that you live by. There's certain authority structures, institutions. There's certain ways that you're to live. But this, that's why this context is so important. Because as we get into this week, we're going to see that this is what we're struggling with. Because we don't know God. We don't know how big he is or how good he is. We don't know how he thinks. We don't know how to look at a context. And say, God, this is how you would deal with this. Now, knowing how God would deal with it doesn't remove the pain of it. In fact, it may be more painful. Okay, so starting in Genesis, where are you? Men love darkness. This aspect of we want to remove a context. We want to remove this, this sense of who, who defines, who has the authority. Where, you know, if we look at children, what are they the fruit of? What are the systems? So how do we define this? Here's a, here's a uh, Calvin and Hobbes, it's a comic strip, so bear with me. Calvin says, Dad, can you get my ball out of the gutter again? And his dad says, this is the third time this afternoon. I thought I told you to play out back. Calvin says, relax, Dad, it's just a ball in the gutter. It's not as if I've been embezzling money or killing people, right? Aren't you glad I'm not stealing and murdering? And then Calvin walks away and he says, I always have to help Dad establish the proper context. <laughs> now, that's, that, this is the hard work. Who defines the context? And without the wisdom of God, it will be our culture, it will be our own gifts, it will be our own preferences, it will be our own, and take your pick, cultural, family, whatever models you're working from. And this is a challenge for us. And we, we have flexibility where God says we have flexibility, but then there's certain places where he says, no, this is, this, is, this is the way it's supposed to be. Work towards this. Now, let me show you again another little image here. Okay, there's a couple of fish. Now let's look, look at the context for the fish. Now, does the, ch does the context change the, the, how you view the fish? Yeah, because it gives you a bigger picture in which to define the elements within the story. Now, the challenge for us is what defines the context of our lives. What defines the context of our ministry? What defines the context for the kids? Now, this, don't get me wrong here. This is hard work. Very hard work. Because we're talking about the heart, not just the head. Now, if we were to look at this, we need a context for discipling the nations. Okay, right now, the only context we have is the ecclesiastical structure. In other words, bring the church, bring Jesus into the church, and, and that's all we need to do, is love the kids, give them a safe place, and everything's going to be okay. That's been the predominant context for the last 100, 150, maybe even 200 years. Now, you will have seen this already, so you already know. We've got to open it up. We've got to bring in media. How do we, how do we get the truth out about government, justice issues, business, God's way of providing, family, looking at intimacy for kids, um, arts and entertainment, the beauty of God. 
Okay, education, the wisdom of God, and science and technology and the laws of God. Now, the, the challenge for us as we look at discipline and nations, all of you have wonderful ideas. You have emotions. You are for this because of possibly pain in your own life, because of situations there that God is using to stir you. But are you looking at it and saying, okay, God, what's the context of bringing Jesus into media, you know, business? Do I put a, a fish symbol or a cross on my business card? Well, now that's a Christian business. You know, this, this is the challenge for us. This is the work that wherever you're going to be. So if you've been involved in government issues in regards to social services, what are the basis of government? How does God want justice to be? Or do we just bring the ecclesiastical structure into the whole framework and forget about everything else? If we do that, we're, we're not thinking biblically. So this, this struggle, this pressure, this, this um, work for us is to go back and look at what's the context in the domain, whether we call it the seven mountains or the domains or the seven pillars or however different people use it. But what we're re really saying is, God, what's the context for children? for the family, for the government. And in fact, I think Jana says it in the first week, the, first, the easiest way to gauge the, the capacity of a nation's maturity is by looking at the weakest element, the kids. And by looking at the kids, it will tell you what aspects of the nation needs to be discipled. Family, government, business. Those are the focuses. And if you don't focus on those others, as well as the kids, you'll never really deal with the root problems. That's the challenge for us as we're looking at the context for dealing with these things. Okay? A um, couple questions I'll leave you with. Who am I and who decides what is important for my life? And what do I desire to do but can't?